Yeah, that's the the beauty of EVM equivalence is that projects that they're running on Ethereum L1 now can deploy in a couple of minutes to, to ZKVM. Welcome to Polygon Pod. Here, we ask the most important questions about the future of Web3 from our vantage point at the center of the Ethereum ecosystem. My name is Pavel. I am content leader at Polygon and the host of Polygon Pod. There's a famous adage by science fiction writer Arthur Clarke, which says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's very true of technical underpinnings of Web3, but there's one technology that stands out as especially magical. Zero knowledge proofs. ZK, as it's known, is built as the ultimate way to scale Ethereum and the idea of a zero knowledge Ethereum virtual machine is at the core of that promise. In the recent months, a number of projects have come out with their own versions of a ZK EVM, uh, making a number of claims that could be a little bit difficult to evaluate for a non-technical person. Now, Polygon is at the forefront of this research, and we wanted to bring some of our experts to help us parse this highly arcane subject that also happens to be extremely crucial to the future of Web3. Our guests today are David Schwartz, uh, co-founder of Polygon ID and Polygon Hermes, and Brendan Farmer, co-founder of Polygon Zero. Okay, guys, uh, welcome to Polygon Pod. Thanks, Paolo. Thank you. I'd like to start by um, doing a quick speed run through through the basics of ZK. Um, just for the for the uninitiated here, you know, can we can we do like a very simple thing? What is what in the world is uh, zero knowledge proofs? Uh, LE five under fifty seconds. Who wants to take that on? <laughs> Bring them. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so zero knowledge proofs, it's a, a cryptographic primitive, like a building block or an operation. And it allows us to uh, take some program and prove that given uh, some input, uh, the program executed correctly without actually downloading and, and going through those, those steps. Um, and so this program or a circuit uh, or statement can be arbitrary. And so we can do things like uh, we can prove that given some state transition that uh, a VM uh, executed correctly uh, over, you know, like let's say it's the EVM uh, over some number of Ethereum transactions without actually downloading um, any of the, uh, the information or, or, or data used to. Um, to compute those those two transitions in the zk for dummies the example they use is uh you know where's wally or where's waldo depending with the uk and the us the picture where you find that one character proving that you know where the character is without actually disclosing its location um it might not be immediately intuitive but you kind of hinted it already like why would that uh quality of math help scale anything particularly ethereum well, I think that there's two two kind of uh, usage for this technology. Uh, one is uh, verification of correctness of a specific computation, uh, and this is where it probably makes more sense to to just uh, describe that what Brendan was saying. No? We we have this uh, uh, kind of uh, transactions or let's say um, programs that we want to verify with some zero knowledge proof computation. And the verifier accepts this proof, which is tiny, which is uh, succinct to verify. And this is where probably uh, you are avoiding to recompute all these programs in every uh, validator. So we are compressing a lot. Uh, and this is where it helps to scalability. And then we have uh, also the use case where uh, you have some private inputs of this computation and you prove something about these inputs. And this is where probably the zero knowledge uh, makes uh, more sense in terms of uh, description because you are you don't share uh, inputs with the verifier. But for scalability, is basically uh, you know this uh, verification of computation, which is probably called validity proofs. And some in some projects we discuss about validity proofs for this scalability use case. Mm, gotcha. So 
We know what ZK are. Uh, we know why they help with scaling and privacy potentially. Uh, Ethereum virtual machine. We're, we're getting to ZK VM. Um, Am I, am I getting this correct? It's basically like a mechanism by which the Ethereum blockchain executes uh, transactions, or it's kind of like a computer running the Ethereum network, and it's you know, tasked with like ensuring the integrity of changes and the changes in the state of the blockchain. That's sort of like the keywords here. Does that about cover it? Yeah, it's a it's a computer that you run on your computer that accepts a bunch of transactions. If you're running an Ethereum node, that accepts a bunch of a bunch of transactions and. Um, and executes them, uh, and then uh, so nodes will will agree on uh, like what the state is uh, after a certain block of transactions, and um, uh, the EVM just ensures that they end up with the same the same result. Gotcha. The EVM was not really designed for zero knowledge proofs. So so to sort of get the all the goodness of EVM with the goodness of zero knowledge proofs, we need a zk EVM. Maybe for starters, like you often, you know, the concept of sort of ZK proof has been around since like 1989, I think, you know, I remember uh, reading that it's until recently been considered moon math, uh, something that might not be even attainable in, 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 in near future. Why, why is that so hard? Why is ZKVM such a holy grail when it comes to uh, achievement? Well, ZKVM, uh, let's say, the scalability um, of Ethereum is, has been an issue for for a long time, and then we we have this uh, scalability dilemma, which is a triple problem. You can achieve two of uh, these options, like uh, security of decentralization and scalability. So uh, the problem with Ethereum layer one is that uh, the scalability is not achieved because the priority was to to achieve this secure and decentralized system. Uh, but with the CKVM, and if you think about this model where the proofs are, uh, you know, validating computation, uh, you get this model where working as a layer two, you benefit from the Ethereum security and decentralization, and you are able to process much more transactions than layer one. Because basically what we are doing in the CKVM is replacing this model of uh, verifying transactions uh, where in layer one, you are uh, recomputing transactions in every node of the network. Uh, with this layer two CKVM, we are accepting a small proof that uh, a single operator is creating from the computation of transactions. So you don't need to repeat this computation along nodes. And this is where scalability happens. So it's very important that these uh, zero knowledge circuits or zero knowledge uh, assumptions that you are doing are in some way. Um, the new consensus in some in some way because uh, in the current blockchains you trust in the consensus protocols to validate uh, let's say a set of transactions in layer 2 CKVM you are doing this uh, based on the circuit so of course uh, our objective was to scale ethereum in the first place so we wanted to to be uh, absolutely let's say respecting the ethereum constraints and the behavior and this is why we call it CKVM. I think too the uh, what, what one thing that you can emphasize is um, like ZK and your CPU are you, you can think of both as computing environments, but they're very different computing environments in terms of like how they work and what's expensive in one is not necessarily expensive in the other. Um, and so part of the reason why ZKVM is is like such a big milestone and why it was seen as so difficult to attain is that um, like in the ZK environment, we like natively we're working with like finite field operations and we're basically like programming with polynomials and uh, in your CPU, like the fundamental operation is like bit flips um, and like, like basic, you know, 64 bit um, uh, like binary field operations and so a lot of the things like, like the EVM is optimized to run on your CPU. Um, and so like a lot of the operations that it uses like, uh, 256 bit binary field operations and, um, uh, like hash functions that, uh, rely on a lot of, uh, like bit flipping and binary operations. Those are, um, 
sort of at first glance, like really, really expensive to do in the ZK computing environment. And so, uh, yeah, so, so, so it was seen as like, um, you know, the, the, the natural impulse for developers is, uh, okay, let's, uh, like maximize performance. And so a lot of people saw the ZK context and were like, Oh, you know, a, a ZK VM will never work. Um, it will never be practical. Instead, let's build something that, um, is like more native to a ZK environment. Uh, and let's, you know, ignore EVM compatibility and, um, and sort of, uh, conforming with, uh, the requirements of the EVM. Um, and so that, I think that, that tension between, uh, like EVM compatible or EVM equivalents, um, being able to like directly verify Ethereum transactions and ZK performance, um, has really been like a, a storyline, um, of ZK rollups, like, practically since they uh, were created that, that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense um um in, in when, when we're talking about these compromises we mean basically creating bespoke bespoke virtual machines and maybe potentially using languages that are not compatible with solidity i mean what, what other sort of like pathways ar- around this problem that projects have chosen yeah, so I think that there are basically three main approaches, um, like two or three. Um, so the first is, uh, like an entirely, uh, like native ZK approach where you make, uh, no attempts to be, um, compatible with Solidity or, uh, Ethereum transactions. Um, the middle path is EVM compatibility, uh, where you still sort of try to get toward uh, like a more performant um, uh, virtual machine for a ZK environment, but you um, support or, or, or claim to support um, like compiling solidity to that virtual machine. And then there's uh, like a fully um, EVM equivalent approach where you're actually uh, verifying um, the execution of the EVM. And so you can, as David said, you, you can reuse, uh, exactly all source code. You can reuse tooling and, um, it's basically an identical experience for users and developers. Yeah. As, as Brenda was saying, uh, these three alternatives or, uh, options now probably, uh, we have a different perspective, but some time ago, like one year and a half ago, uh, the discussion was about CK rollups being practical and possible. So that uh, makes a lot of sense that uh, a lot of teams were trying different approaches. And uh, in fact, teams in Polygon, we are also doing the same uh, because it's uh, not so clear which was the right one. Uh, the, the, the risk of targeting EBM equivalents and not being practical was uh, a real risk. And uh uh, in, in the CKVM example of Polygon, uh, it was the combination of different approaches and technologies that uh, made uh, this practical. Because in the end, it was about the scalability. So you need to make sure that you are able to create a lot of proofs and being uh, you know, fast to verify this computation. So the, the design, let's say, um, decisions were very targeted on let's make this practical and feasible. And uh, the evolution in this field has been amazing in the last year, I would say. And it's, uh, let's say, accelerating every time. Uh, this uh, pernicious innovation across uh, several teams with new approaches and new ideas, it's uh, becoming super interesting for the space. And we are super excited about what's, what's to come. Has there been any breakthroughs that, that got us from moon math and, you know, years to go to like actually having test nets? I mean, like if you look like at other fields, let's say like deep learning recently, there's, there's been a clear sort of milestone GPUs plus tons of data plus uh, PhDs coming up with new neural networks. Bam, you know, supernova. Uh, it, it seems like for ZK, that's not really the case. There was not a single breakthrough you could point to. Is it just simply, you know, building these things out and, 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 and traveling these paths or what's, what's behind this, this sudden uh, breakthrough in making these things possible? Yeah, I think um, over the last decade um, there's been uh, really incredible progress. So um 
in, uh, I think like 2013, um, this paper, uh, P or G P G R. I, I forget what the, it's too early to remember uh, who the authors were, but, um, that, that sort of kicked off, um, this new, uh, wave of development, uh, yeah, maybe G P G R or something. Um, and, uh, so that, uh, was the first instance in, in which you had, um, uh, like zero knowledge proofs that were, uh, succinct enough to, to sort of be interesting and, and to be practical, um, and also could be generated in a reasonable amount of time. Um, the problem was, uh, that up until fairly recently, um, there were a lot of restrictions on, uh, on zero knowledge proofs in general. So, um, they weren't, uh, that performant and, um, you had to, uh, rely on a trusted setup. So every like program that you wanted to run, uh, required you to, um, basically do this, uh, multi-party computation with, uh, a bunch of, of, uh, sort of mutually, uh, trusting parties, um, to, to generate, uh, like the secret data, uh, that everyone would, would sort of contribute to and, and then throw away their, their individual, like part of the secret, um, uh, in order to like create something that like no one has like full access to. Um, and that was required for, for like generating a zero knowledge proof. Um, and so, uh, in the last like four or five years we've had, or three or four years, we, we've had really interesting breakthroughs where, um, we've removed that requirement for a trusted setup. Uh, and so we have zero knowledge proofs that are transparent and then, we actually have seen like an exponential increase in performance. Um, so the team that I work on zero has been focused on, uh, accelerating zero knowledge proofs for the last, um, like year and a half. Um, and so we have made a lot of progress in, um, accelerating prover speed and making recursive proofs really, really efficient. So instead of, uh, like a single machine having to, uh, create a, Proof for a very big statement, we can break that statement up into smaller components, prove them in parallel on different machines, and then aggregate those proofs together. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think uh, I think one of the things that we've done really well at Polygon is sort of bet on like the future progress of the technology and bet that it would uh, be performant enough for us to like set really ambitious goals for. Uh, like EVM equivalents and, and the user experience and the developer experience for the ZKVM. And, and I think the collaboration among the teams working at Polygon has been a uh, really good thing. Yeah, talking talking about collaboration, uh, what Brendan was, was stating, uh, just uh, as a reference, uh, we started the project in, uh, let's say, April 2021, and the EVM equivalent CK rollup seemed like a kind of a strange idea because it seems not seems not feasible. And uh, yeah, it was basically Jordi's uh, concept of uh, with a new model of uh, arithmetization because you need to arithmeticize everything for for being a CK solved in some way. And uh, this creation of a new let's say processor and, and this kind of steam machines ideas. But uh, the problem we had is that. Uh, we were facing the challenge of being practical and uh, with collaboration of uh, Brendan's team, uh, Polygon CEO, and also Bobbins, uh, Polygon Python. Uh, let's say the, the, the capability to accelerate and to build uh, this technology based on the combination of start proofs and, and snarks uh, with a good deal of fixed fields that uh, is the, the big innovation here in, in Zero. We were able to accelerate 40 times the proof time uh, which made this uh, from a, let's say, complicated idea to something that's feasible. And we are continuing optimis- optimizing also in this, in this collaboration with some ideas from, from Dario, for example. We are reducing the recursive proofs to, to seconds, to very little time. So the next testnet uh, version will be probably out next week and we will include the recursion. And every time we do a new version of the prover, we are accelerating a lot. So, uh, these, these uh, ideas of, uh, let's say, optimization 
are making feasible that CK proofs can be run in every potential way. Uh, for example, in Polygon ID, we also have a, let's say, a privacy-based protocol, and we are creating proofs in the mobile device. So uh, to get some credentials and prove something about you in a device in three, four seconds makes that the seamless proofs can be run anywhere. And uh, this innovation is becoming more and more uh, accelerated, and we expect that many, many uh, advantages from that, and uh, we are super excited about this. And for listeners and viewers who may not be familiar with this history, Polygon Hermes uh, became part of sort of the bigger uh, Polygon family last summer, I believe, and and Brendan's Polygon Zero, previously Mir. Uh, I think you guys join around uh, December, November. Yeah. And just to like sort of actually to spell out, you know, we also obviously have Polygon Maiden, uh, with, with led by Bob. And uh, how did the three different teams feed into making Polygon ZKVM not only possible, but also possible it's in kind of a, a record time, if you could just hit on like the main notes? Yeah, I think um, this is a really interesting question because... Um, I think there was sort of a lot of like armchair quarterbacking after those acquisitions were announced. Um, and uh, the criticism was, well, y you have three teams that are trying to do the three, like the same thing. And uh, like, are these teams going to compete with each other? Like how, like, you know, how is this going to work? Isn't this just sort of like a spray and pray uh, acquisition strategy? Um, and that really couldn't be further from the truth. And like, if you think about uh, what would have happened if we had like instantly merged our efforts, um, we uh, like wouldn't have like we, we would have had to immediately converge on what we were working on. Um, and so, like Hermes at the time was sort of furthest along, and they were working on a, a different proving system, and we were working on something that was more speculative. Um, and so it was actually really important for us to be sort of siloed and autonomous and be able to like pursue this line of R and D that eventually became, um, Plunky 2 and Starkey, which are proving systems that, um, were, were heavily optimized. Um, and so the way that I have seen it is, um, like zero has, uh, sort of the mandate to, um, basically work on, uh, like R and D and, and proving system improvements that can be reused, um, across Polygon. Uh, Maiden is focused on, uh, like both applying Stark expertise, but also building, um, uh, like a more kind of ZK optimized, uh, VM. And then obviously, um, David and his team have been, uh, focused on building the, the ZK VM. And so, and, and, and I mean, they're, they're have been very focused on, on shipping and, and are, are really good uh, at doing that. And, and, and so I think the, the uh, strengths are, are very complementary. Interesting. David, you want to add something to that? Or? Well, uh, yeah, I totally agree with what Bernard was saying. Uh, I would say the, the model we have internally is uh, pretty optimal to have, to have these different approaches that also address next generations of this uh, technology because uh, as the changes are so fast, uh, let's say today in CKVM, we are closing a, a version of the prover. And uh, probably there's some, we have a lot of ideas already how to improve this prover. <laughs> so uh, if you will be working on the new ideas, you will never close some version. So uh, these ideas are flowing between teams and we are contributing uh, and helping along a lot each other. And we have uh, these different initiatives that cover different aspects, as Brenda was saying. But at the same time, um, we have some kind of independence to ship things in parallel. So we are not in a big, big team of CK. We are doing different projects that are, you know, um, covering different scenarios and probably different phases too of the technology in, in Polygon. So this is how, I, how we work. And I think it's very optimal. Gotcha. Uh, just out of curiosity, obviously, Hermes was the sort of the first member of the Polygon ZK team. Maiden came second, and then and then there was Zero. At the time, as these teams were joining, do you did you guys foresee these pieces fitting together, or um, 
was it serendipity, you know, or was it sort of a deep strategy? I'd say maybe a combination. I think, um, I think the bet was that, uh, like talent is always additive and like talent in the ZK, uh, space is really, really scarce. Um, and so, so I think that the, I'm not sure that we want to give the, uh, the Polygon founders too much credit for, uh, for, for like, uh, you know, projecting exactly how it would fit. But I, I think that they made a really, really good bet. Um, and they had a lot of conviction in this space, which I think, uh, is, is like a really impressive thing in retrospect. Um, and, you know, fundamentally the bet was that if you could collect, uh, like a bunch of talented people, um, that had, you know, pretty low ego that were like open to collaboration and, and like fundamentally got along, um, that that collaboration would result in, in something really special. Yeah, I will highlight also this aspect of the low ego, but uh, not only this, but also uh, it's surprising how we can just uh, be collaborative and get so well along. And it's uh, I'm super proud that this is happening and uh, this creates a lot of value because uh, uh, mutual contribution and collaboration uh, is, uh, you know, some benefit that comes uh, from their mutual trust and that we are uh, shipping and working towards the same direction. And we want uh, Polygon to become kind of a leader in the CK space. But uh, it's so, so, you know, changing this uh, this trend of, uh, you know, Polygon is uh, only a, a BD team, but it's not true. Polygon is uh, shipping in many lines, uh, a, an impressive portfolio of uh, uh, PR solutions, uh, Avail, uh, you know, Supernets, and also CK. And CK is kind of a inter interesting component that will be uh, utilized in many lines of uh, many, many services and products in in the Polygon, uh, let's say, portfolio of uh, solutions. So uh, this is very strategic topic, but uh, the way we are collaborating and thinking the the good and the higher benefit of uh, the Polygon, uh, let's say family of uh, technology is uh, very interesting. Got it. So that kind of gets us to the present te uh, present tense. We have uh, ZKVM testnet out there. People should check it out for sure. Um, let's talk about Polygon ZKVM. Uh, you know, we're not alone in this space, obviously. And, and when we launched, uh, there was a bit of a back and forth about who's the first and who is not. Um, uh, what sets us apart from the rest? I mean, the, the rest... First thing, the rest are amazing things. So I will start with this. Uh, because uh, we had, uh, in our perspective, uh, we have a healthy, let's say, relationship with most of teams. And we are trying to do our project. So um, the rest of the teams are also trying to get to the same objective. And in some way, uh, we are happy to be part of this ecosystem. So said so, um, in, in Polygon CKVM, what we're trying to do is to, to explain what, what is happening today. So if we say we have source code available, we have source code available. And if we say we have a testnet, we have a testnet. So assumptions, um, we want to reduce assumptions here. I mean, our source code is uh, out there. Uh, everybody can check. It's editable. Uh, uh, we have received many contributions. There are some teams trying to just deploy themselves uh understand and, and test and you know, play a little bit with that. And we have all the tooling out there. And um, and what we are explaining is uh, what we are doing uh, in real time. We are also working openly because the repositories are just open. Everybody can see what we are doing today. What's the plan? What's the name of the issues? What's the problems we want to solve today? And uh, that's basically, in my view, it's a big difference because... Um, we are not uh, promising things in the future. Of course, the future we imagine and we envision a very amazing future, but uh, today is what, is what we got. So uh, the situation today is that we have uh, the first uh, open source or well, open source is a, is a word to discuss because uh, the, the source code is available. The license open source will happen eventually, but uh, except for the prover, everything is open source and the prover will be open source eventually too. But uh, everything is out there. You can see that the testnet is running with complete proofs generated and, and operative. So uh, on top of that is an EVM equivalent uh, system, and you can try. There are 
In the current testnet, there are like 2,000 smart contracts deployed by users permissionless. Uh, so um, I don't know what else we can say. We are, we are implementing next version of the testnet uh, at shipping next week, probably, with a recursion of proofs, uh, with acceleration on some performance improvements. And this is basically uh, the path we are following towards the mainnet because uh, the audits are just running and started and we are super happy how, how this process is going. Uh, but uh, basically what we're trying to, to be is rigorous uh, about what we state. Uh, whatever we say needs to be correct, needs to be precise, and needs to be true because uh, there's a lot of lines of work in progress and Brendan can just... Uh, you know, uh, continue this, this uh, explanation. But, of course, the future is uh, amazing for CK teams. But the problem is that, uh, in some way, um, we are uncomfortable uh, in some, let's say, discussions where we don't know what other teams are doing. Because, uh, first thing, they need to publish source code. Then uh, we can just compare. We can just discuss. Otherwise, we are just uh, in arguments that doesn't make much sense. And just to be absolutely clear, making source code available means allowing others to verify your claims. That's what we're saying, right? Verify claims, uh, reproduce, contribute, criticize, uh, get ideas, uh, all of it. This is how permissionless innovation works. Uh, if you don't share your work with the community, in some way, uh, you are just competing in the traditional models. Uh, we, we understand that the uh, the blockchain model is more, let's say, open in this sense. And uh, we are happy to share our, uh, let's say, technology and ideas with other teams um, because uh, we also have benefited from the ideas and technology from other teams. So we, we think it's it's fair and it's uh, the model to go. Gotcha. Brenda, you had you had a really great Twitter thread recently about what what Polygon ZKVM is optimizing optimizing for and how that might separate it from other projects. You want to maybe talk to that real quick? Yeah, basically, um, the argument was that optimizing for user experience and developer experience uh, can often be uh, the most important thing and. So uh, essentially, I, I, I was noting that um, a lot of uh, other teams that have been doing this for longer than, than we have, have have not optimized for EBM equivalents. Um, and I think that implicitly, that's that was a bet that uh, like that optimizing for EBM equivalents and, and for user experience and developer experience would be too expensive or would be impractical. Um, due to the like costs and performance limitations of the underlying technology. Um, and so like one thing that I'm really proud of that we've done at Polygon is uh, to bet on the continued progress and improvement of the underlying technology and to prioritize like the things that are most important. So user experience and developer experience. Um, and, you know, as, as David said, I, I, I don't think that you can emphasize enough that uh, like how big a milestone the ZK ABM test set releases. Like we have for the first time, uh, like a prover that is practical. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure if this is the version that's currently on test net, but the current benchmark is uh, a minute of proving time on an AWS machine that costs $7 an hour, uh, for a 10 million gas block. And we expect that that will, will continue to improve in the future. Um, and like we have uh, in the Tesla environment, full EVM equivalents. So like the optimal developer and user experience, uh, anyone can take code that uh, is live on Ethereum and, and with no changes, just deploy it to the ZK VM test Um All tooling works, um, transactions uh, execute exactly as, as you would expect them to. Um, and so I think that that, you know, is, is a huge milestone. And um, I think one that, uh, you know, w w w was, was unexpected. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's been really impressive how quickly um, we've managed to ship and, and get things out of Polygon. 
this this idea of EVM equivalence uh, versus, let's say, EVM compatibility, I think it's kind of worth dwelling on it maybe for just a few minutes. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, obviously the co-founder of Ethereum, has weighed into this whole uh, uh, conversation and came up with sort of a, a framework for for tiering the various ZKVM projects that are out there. Is it maybe worth introducing it to our readers here? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, uh, Vitalik was... Um putting some kind of order into this mess of uh, CKVM comparisons and, you know, framework uh, messy. Um, so what he was stating is that uh, different tires of or different types of uh, CKVM correspond to different uh, level of uh, fidelity or equivalence to Ethereum. So there's uh, a top one, which is uh, the, the, let's say, absolutely compatible to Ethereum. Um, that would be kind of uh, able to, to replace even some Ethereum clients in some way. And so this is super high fidelity. Then there's uh, type 2 and type 3. That's EVM equivalence, depending on the, the gas model and the full implementation of Ethereum opcodes, you will be type 2 or type 3. But basically, it's not. you don't need to respect all the Ethereum data structures or, let's say, the full behavior, as long as the user has a transparent experience in some way. And then you have the type four, which is where uh, you are providing a scalability that's uh, compatible with Ethereum in some way. So users probably need to, to do some kind of uh, intermediate process or a transformation or compilation of code to have a, a, an experience that's very close to Ethereum in some way. So this is what Brendan was stating as uh, these, uh, let's say, initial approaches where uh, you are optimizing for CK but uh, probably you don't um, target the, the, the best experience for users. So the more, the upper you go into this, uh, let's say, or the highest compliance you want to have for users, you are type one. And uh, the Vitalik approach was saying, okay, the more optimized you are in terms of CK, uh, let's say efficiency, probably you get better performance. But to be honest, I think uh, the latest breakthroughs uh, in cryptographic uh, CK, let's say, models. I don't know how this improvement in performance will be. But what I know is that the user experience is uh, key to have this kind of um, native scalability for Ethereum, which was basically what we are trying to do and what it's uh, all about. So uh, regarding performance, uh, theoretically, there's an advantage in Type 4. Uh, the truth is that I, I, I would like to see implementations actually out there to, to compare because it's something today is not, uh, uh, it's very difficult to get numbers. And I think he, he, go ahead. Sorry, Brendan. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to say, yeah, to, to sort of emphasize that. I, I think one thing that's important is like, it, it, it's like a, a tendency or, or like an impulse for developers to optimize for performance, uh, sort of at, at all costs, but, um, like David was saying, like, uh, maybe there's, you know, to be very, very generous, maybe there's a 100 X difference in performance between, um, like a type two and a type four, um, uh, ZKVM. Um, but like fundamentally the, the argument is if we already can achieve sufficient performance, um, as a type two, uh, like, you, you know, under, uh, one cent transaction fees, um, for, for proving, um, then like fundamentally it doesn't make sense to optimize for performance in that case to get transaction fees down to like one hundredth of a cent. Um, because like we, it, it like from, you know, a, a holistic cost perspective, uh, it's better to, uh, optimize for like the developer experience and to minimize audits and changes and, and, and for the user experience to be able to reuse tooling. Um, so that's sort of like the bet that's being made on, on ZKVM. And so, so like it's easy to sort of criticize and say, Oh, you know, we, we, we can build something that's, you know, in theory more performant, um, uh, like as a ZKV as a type four or ZKVM as opposed to ZKVM. Um, but like, there's very little discussion of the cost and sort of the like holistic um, like benefits of, of that approach. 
Interesting. And I think Vitalik also sort of picked this as a type three, which is almost equivalent, but not, you know, compatible with most applications, most, but not all applications aspiring to be a type two. Would that transition from type three to type two, uh, obviously expanding compatibility come at a cost of performance? Or do you think it's possible to, to, to do that without sacrificing performance? No, it will be very close to that. It's a matter of implementation. There's some primitives uh, corresponding to some precompiled smart contracts that we need to implement next year. And basically, some hashing functions and pings. Um, we have shared with, uh, with the community that this is pending, uh, but they will be implemented next year. So probably we will get some additional cost in terms of parameterization or polynomial numbers, but it's going to be, it will be not, not super relevant. It's going to be here. Uh, very optimal anyway. And uh, the pace of optimizations we are following is bigger than the cost of this inclusion. But probably will be type 2 CKVM during next year. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. Um, there's this, uh, I want to come back to this one, one recurrent topic is the issue of the prover. Uh, for people who are, may not be like f not familiar with the uh, ZK architectures, me personally, uh, uh, why is the prover such an, an important aspect of it? And, and, and what do people need to know about the prover? Yeah, it's the, so the, the, the prover, uh, I think we generally include um, like the, the proof system itself and then all of the uh, sort of associated like circuitry that we use to, to represent um, the EVM and, and like the ZK uh, the computing context. Um, and I, I, I think that there's so much emphasis because uh, it's the most complex part to implement and it's the most performance sensitive uh, component. So, um, you know, right now our, our proving times are, are, are pretty good, but um, like if it were uh, it, like if we were off by two orders of magnitude and, and it took like, you know, 10 to 100 X um, longer to generate a proof, then uh, it wouldn't be practical for us to run um, the EVM from like a cost and a latency perspective. Um, and so I, I, I think that's just, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, I, I think that's um, the reason for the emphasis. Maybe uh, the question was more about why the prover is the key component. Uh, and, and I think uh, if I understand the question is that uh, a CK rollup without the prover is nothing. So uh, basically, you have a client of a network, and as I was saying before, the the key question is here: uh, what's the trust model of this decentralized system? Because unless you you have a prover, and this prover is uh, something you can audit or you can trust in some way, uh, if there's no public scrutiny on something, then you are trusting the team that's doing this, and. Uh, the prover is kind of uh, where the, the magic of the secret rollup happens and where the validity proofs provide the finality and provides the, the let's say, insurance that this is compute according to the rules of Ethereum and according to the rules of a decentralized system that you that is trustless and you can uh, just, uh, you're not trusting anyone. That is kind of a behavior of a blockchain. Yeah, thank you. That, that's, that's very helpful. I actually like to be able to sort of kind of like encapsulate our conversations so far for people who are non-technical and who, let's say, look at the various projects coming up. Uh, you know, just, just recently we had a, a new project from Consensus, you know, announcing that they're working on ZKVM and they're, let's say they want to take a look at it and interrogate it. You know, what are the claims being made? What are the things to you and pay attention to because obviously there's so many specs you know you might have proof time verification time proof size amortization costs like which of them are important if you were to come up with like a short list of like heuristics for things to pay attention so i think one that we saw already is whether the source code is available uh for the project um the second one might be finality time why, why would finality time be important here well finality time is linked to the time to generate proofs uh, in some way and uh, from the user perspective, uh, the experience of finality is important in a blockchain. Uh, so, well, you may be um, combining finality with cost as a trade-off, probably, because uh, the most the more proof you do to get faster finality, probably you are paying more fees in layer one. 
uh, but yeah, finality is a very important property. Is, is there a benchmark that projects are aiming for or, or a number against, against which, could, which you could measure a threshold perhaps? It's, it's really opaque um, because uh, I think we are the only project that has uh, a prover that anyone can uh, check out and run. And um, I, yeah, and, and it's complete and, and reflects like what we're using um, in in the test set. Um, I would say a, a, as far as like metrics uh, to judge projects on, I, I, I would look at um, like the degree of EVM equivalence and then the uh, like, like actual reproducible performance. Um, but you can go into GitHub, you can clone the repository and you can run, uh, you can generate a proof um, on your local machine. Uh, again, I, I think that we are the only uh, project that, that provides that. Um, but yeah, I, I think like EVM equivalence, whether uh, you can just deploy um, a contract as is uh, without any changes or whether you have to use a compiler, um, which uh, breaks compatibility with uh, developer tooling because a lot of uh, tools that developers use um, requires like, uh, like being able to inspect the actual like bytecode and, and the opcodes that are produced um, in a transaction. Um, and then, so even equivalence and then, uh, like actual testable, reproducible, um, performance. Mm. I, I would add also to this, uh, yeah, yeah, I would add to this because as we are uh, getting close to the, this kind of mainnet launches for projects, um, or even testnet, but there's, uh, an interesting framework that Vitalik, uh, was also describing about, uh, security assumptions. Uh, in a blog post in Ethereum Magicians uh, about training wheels for, for secure rollups. And I think this is also an interesting uh, topic to take into account. What's the security assumptions? Because uh, you need to know uh, if you're using a, a protocol or a, or a network in, in mainnet, what's the degree of uh, centralization, decentralization as this um, maturity comes in some way. Thank you, guys. And, and maybe just as we are approaching the, the, the end of the, of the recording, in closing, let's talk a little bit about what's ahead for Polygon CKVM. We're currently in a testnet. What could people look forward to the next in the coming months and weeks? The testnet will be upgraded probably next week, uh, including the new optimizations and recursion. These kind of things are very interesting. Uh, for us, it's uh, the last preparation for the mainnet launch. So probably we will be uh, launching mainnet in the first quarter of next year. After these experiences and, and the initial output of the audits come, and uh, also we will be publishing these security assumptions as the let's say public information about uh, what's the status of the network, what's uh, the model that the users are trusting. But uh, basically, we want to go mainnet to get some experience with a public network. And uh, probably after this um, initial version, that probably will be not, not for production, not suggested for production, we will be having the release for production. But that's it. I mean, there's a lot of uh, optimizations on the way, and uh, probably some upgrades will be happening this year to include uh, feature complete for Ethereum equivalents or uh, strong optimizations in terms of performance but um, not very much uh, else. I think we are very excited about uh, the testnet performance and the development, and uh, we are targeting mainnet as soon as possible. And I think it's also worth mentioning that there is already a number of projects that are that are using the testnet, so it, it's not likely to be the case that you know we go mainnet and then people first start to get their hands on it. There's quite a few prominent projects that are already test driving it, so uh, I think from from uh, you know proof of concept to testnet to an actual living implementation where it's it's powering adoption and and scalability in ethereum the that road might be shorter than it might seem yeah that's the the beauty of uh, evm equivalence is that um yeah i mean projects that uh they're running on ethereum l1 now can uh, deploy uh in a couple minutes to um, the, the experience in the desert has been amazing because uh, there were 
uh, zero support for, for teams. So they were using the testnet by themselves. So this kind of uh, equivalence is super achieved. The initial objective of testnet was to see the program running for for the say stable purposes and then security purposes. We had uh, more than 15,000 proofs already in, in layer one. So it's kind of a very stable model. And also to test if projects will be able to, to use this seamlessly and alone. And uh, because we want, we want to run a decentralized network that's uh, permissionless and we are just uh, burning stages and covering these phases. But at some point, it needs to be decentralized and a project that's just uh, out there for the community. So uh, this way of uh, seamless integration with uh, existing contracts uh, minimize the impact for projects for audits or gas models control and these kind of things. Uh, the experience has been amazing. So the objectives are fulfilled in this sense. And now it's about preparing, um, you know, all of this uh, set of uh, elements for, for mainnet readiness, but it's a very good experience. Awesome. It, it sounds like there's a lot to look forward to. Guys, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come and do this. This was super informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for